Hallelujah. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet and Savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you, and God be glorified. And as Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn away with me to the book of John. The book of John, and we will read from verse 8, and we will use, uh, excuse me, chapter 8, and we use as our anchor verse uh, 32, and many of you already know it. But uh, the anchor verse there would be uh, verse 32. And it's a simple verse, but it is completely power-packed. John 18, 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth that you know shall make you free. And I'm going to use for a text this morning, evidence demands a verdict. Subtext, Jesus is risen. Evidence demands a verdict. Jesus is risen. We're going to look at this from a case study. And we are in the time now where everyone in the Christian kingdom, as well as in the world, are looking at Jesus through different types of lenses. The perception of Jesus, the, the gaze and the guides of Jesus has been brought to an understanding that how and why should Jesus be the only way. We have many theologians that are wrestling in their minds about is he really the only way? Is it true that when Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man coming to the Father but by me? So there are many questions that are going on today where people are engaging themselves trying to find evidence of a true risen Savior. So this morning in this text, I'm going to unveil some truths to you where we can answer the question concerning evidence demands a verdict Jesus is risen, we can close this case today on the mere fact that not only is he risen in the natural, but he has already been risen in the spiritual in your heart. At the conclusion of this matter, it is my hope that in the interest of the world, and especially and particularly to the next generation and the generation Behind that generation, I find it uh, very necessary for us as preachers and as teachers and just good citizens of the kingdom to make sure that we are not having Jesus by ourselves and not passing the story of who the real Jesus is. I find it very critical in thought that the tendency is that the older you get, you can begin to say, I got him, I, I know him. And at times we can forget about that the story is afresh 
and brand new to every generation that comes after you. It becomes important for us to make sure that we pass the message down to our children so they can know Jesus for themselves. The tendency is to get to the point where I got him, I know him, I talk to him, I pray to him, I know who Jesus is, but we sometimes forget that what we know about Jesus is so critically important to make sure our children can get to know Jesus for themselves. So many are asking this question, uh, who is the God-man that called himself Jesus Christ? And why do he say he is the only way? Who is this God-man that called himself, that is Jesus Christ, and why he say that he is the only way? Note here that I think it's, it's, it's critical for us to understand that the burden of proof, uh, God made a legal binding, a prophetic covenant uh, with the world when he said that he will send Jesus for our sins. He, he came to die for our sins for those tender ears that are first hearing about the story that was not passed on to you from your parents or from your grandparents. Uh, there's a magnificent and joyful story of a super being called God. His name is Yahweh, which means uh, I exist from my existence. I am of my own being, meaning that uh, no one has come before me, no one will come after me. Now, if you go back into your mind, you that are older, if you rewind your mind, you will go back to the same question, if God is God, and, and you would answer your question, if, if uh, Jesus is really the Son of God, then why did he have to die? If you would really challenge yourself and go back and ask yourself some philosophical questions, you would begin to gird up your mind to start thinking how young people think today, because because you got him don't mean they got him. And they have to understand the story so they can understand that the Jesus that you're talking about is real. He, he, he is real. He is present. He is here. He is not going anywhere, but he will return. So many are asking, who is this God man called Jesus Christ? And why is he the only way to God? And I want you to understand that what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to introduce Jesus to you before I present his case. But note here that an introduction is not a relationship. An introduction is not a relationship, and you can name drop, but that don't mean you know me. You can call his name, but that doesn't mean you're in relationship with him. And many times what we've done as believers, especially moving forward with our kids, we tell them about Jesus, but we don't tell them how to get to know Jesus for themselves. If you believe that, say amen. amen. We talk about Jesus and say he's good. We say that he healed the sick and that he raised the dead, that he opened up the blind eyes, he made the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the dumb to talk. And, and we talk about Jesus in a sense like we know him, but to them they don't know him because they have not come to form a relationship with the Jesus that you know. Will the church say amen? So I find it critical not just to give you an introduction but to Jesus, but to let you know that he's real. To those tender ears that may be listening to this CD, I want you to know that he is real. He is everything God said that he would be and more. To those of you that fancy yourself that, you know, I know Jesus, uh, knowing Jesus means that you're in relationship with him. It means that he becomes your best friend. When you know Jesus, you know everything you need to know. And to the young people don't make it spooky because the one that are introducing you to Jesus do not act like they know him themselves. 
Don't allow yourself to get caught up in the, in, in the paralysis of analysis trying to figure out what is their relationship with Jesus and why are they telling me about him. See, I, I've come to understand that God will get anybody to talk to you about Jesus because he loves you just that much. He wants you to know him for yourself. You can't look at everybody and say, well, it's Jesus in them or it's Jesus in them because we are on a spectrum of understanding the power of the one, the true, the only Yeshua Messiah. They call him Jesus Christ. We're on many different spectrums. Some of us are close to him. Some of us are distant from him, but yet we all have been bought with the price of his blood and we all have right to everlasting life. It is this champion, it is this Jesus that I'm talking about. He knows exactly where you are on the kingdom spectrum. If you have accepted Christ as your personal savior, you are saved. You are sanctified and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. You ain't got to try to prove that. It is what it is. You have been bought with a new price. He loved you with everything in you, but he understands that there are different types of people in different types of places and spaces on the kingdom spectrum. You see, you find people that know Jesus, but they're not there yet. Holler back. They know him, but they're not there yet. But it's not our job to make them get there. It is God's job that he is the one that is the author and the finisher of our faith. I dare you to keep coming to church. He's going to perfect you. Hallelujah. I dare you to keep reading your Bible. He's going to perfect you. Why? Because that's what he does. That's who he is. So these questions are coming up, I hear on television that young people today are dropping off like flies from the church. Many don't see the relevancy of God nor his son because they're looking at God from different eyes. Many times they're looking at God from hypocritical eyes. Those that are hypocrites in the church, they're seeing God from their eyes. They're looking at God from the eyes of law. I can't keep it, so why even try to do it? They're looking at God from different types of eyes and microscopes, telescopes. Some are so far off that they don't even know if they have a relationship with God. But God wants me to tell you this morning that he loves you just the way you are. And he sent his son to die for you just the way you are. He don't want anybody to die and go to hell because hell is a real place. It's not where you are on the kingdom spectrum. It's who you have while on it. Will the church say amen? amen? It's just a matter of time before God begins to blow your mind with the stuff that he's going to enlighten in your heart. So the question is, who is this Jesus? Who is this God man? And why is he the only way? There have been many that think because they get introduced to Jesus and we're we're good at that as kingdom citizens. We like to tell people about Jesus. But in the conversation of telling people about Jesus, many times those individuals that we talk to about Jesus does, does not or have not learned how to manage and do a formation of relationship with Jesus. I think it's critical to even talk about that because how we do in the natural many times is how we would do in the spiritual. If you're having bad relationship problems in the natural, you'll probably converse that or you'll probably transfer that to the spiritual and you'll be treating Jesus like you treat other people. You have to make sure that you don't allow your natural to convert to your spiritual. You have to treat Jesus like you really want to get to know him. How many of you have ever met someone for the first time and they, and they said some things or, or shared some things with you and you said, this is a real good person? You know, you, you knew that I can learn from this person. I can get more. Well, I'm here today to tell you there's no other, no other being on the planet, no other person that you can learn more from. So you need to get to know Jesus because you have been introduced to him. Remember, introduction is not relationship. Because you've been introduced to him, you as new converts have to form and maintain the relationship with Jesus as you move forward in the spectrum and on the spectrum of the kingdom. 
You got to decide that I want to know him for myself. I knew him through my mom and him. I knew him through the people in the church. I knew him through the hoop. I knew him through the shout. I knew him through the hollering, screaming. I knew him while running around the church. I knew him that way. But then there's another way where he'll come to you where he'll just take root and settle in your heart. And you'll find yourself moaning without knowing why you're moaning. You'll find yourself speaking in tongues, not understanding where that come from. You'll find yourself just bathing in the love because you know how nasty, filthy, dirty, scoundrel, smirky you are. I mean, there's a strong love that come to you knowing that you mean he really loved me? I mean, do he really love all old nasty, dirty, scoundrel, back, everything me? Do he really love somebody like me? And when you come to rest on the fact that his love will never change for you because God is love and that his love will never change for you, he loves you when you are at your worst. I mean, that's enough right there to just kind of let me know that, that I'm with God and God is with me and he loved me with everything that he has. I want the young people to know that he ain't mad at you. God understand that you're young and, and you're going to do some silly stuff. He, he, he allowed it to be in you that you're going to go through your teenage years and you're going to be rebellious. You're going to do crazy things. You don't think God knows that that's in the soup? Can the church say it's in the soup? See, it's in the soup for them to be that way. God knows that it's all about you. He understands that you ain't afraid of nothing, but he loves you in the midst of where you're at. Well, the church says in the soup. Come on, talk back to him. It says in the soup. Now, we as adults, we can't take it out the soup when it was in our soup. Holler back. Many times we want them to understand God from our perspective. But no God would teach them to understand him from his <laughs> perspective. You trying to get them to understand God from you being grown. You just got yourself together. And you want them to catch on right away. But God says, no, I'm working with him. I'm working with her. You got to understand that God knows how to teach our children. Even when you ain't teaching them, he's teaching them anyway. Even when things look bad, God is still talking to them. Remember, he said, I would that none would perish, but all would come to eternal life. We're talking about this God man. So the first thing that people like to ask the question is, was, was God really man? What well, the scripture gives us where it says, Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. But yet, Jesus was man. Look to your neighbor and say, he was a man. I want you to know that he was a man, so it, it, we can't make it so deep and spooky like somehow he was never a man. He was a man, and he gave us evidence of him being human, evidence of him being a man. Will you look to your neighbor and say he was a God man? I want the young people to understand and those that are new converts in the kingdom of God understand that you're on the right team and that you are in the kingdom of God because you have accepted this God man. But he was God in man, Emmanuel, God in us. So since he was a God man, God in us, we have Jesus that's in us. And all we have to do is let him work us out while we work ourselves out. The scripture says, let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. We got to know that on this kingdom spectrum, we're going to have all kind of people doing all kind of things, but yet saved. <laughs> yes, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. All kind of people doing all kind of things, but yet saved. Save to the fact that they're not there yet. Look to your neighbor and say, I don't think you're there yet. You see, we are all striving for perfection. <laughs> One of these days, we're going to get there. One of these days, we're going to get there, and we only get there when we have been perfected in Christ. When you get perfected in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. And being the righteousness of God, you know what I told you. You may be in right position 
but yet dealing with a wicked condition. It doesn't change your position because you're dealing with a wicked condition. You got to understand, I can't lose with the stuff God used. I got Jesus, and as long as I got Jesus, I got enough. Will the church say amen? So let's not be so uppity and so critical of the fact that and trying to make him more spookier. He, he's not spooky. He was a man. Here's how we know that Jesus was a man. We know that Jesus was a man because he came out of the foreknowledge of God's mind. God spoke into the womb of Mary and Jesus came forth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was raised by a carpenter named Joseph. Jesus started to preach at age 30 and the number 30 itself means maturity. Jesus preached for three and one half years. Now it's amazing that he shook the world up in three and one half years. He didn't even get started until he was 30. So I tell some young folks from time to time, you barely know your name until you get 30. You really don't even know who you are. You're still trying to figure it out. I know I was trying to figure it out when I was in college, still trying to figure it out trying to find out who I am, what my name is, who, 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 who love me, who don't love me. You're in the figuring out stage. But later, Jesus went on at 30. He said, I must be about my father's business. And he began to preach the gospel. Shall we say the gospel of the kingdom? That's the only kingdom that Jesus, only gospel that Jesus preached. Know this, hear this. The only gospel that Jesus preached was the gospel of the kingdom. And then he assigned... Apollos to preach the gospel of grace. He said the kingdom is going to be ineffective if people don't understand because they mess up does not mean that they can't go up. People, the kingdom will be disaffected when people think that because they do wrong and start to feel condemnation. He said that ain't of Jesus. He said you may feel convicted but not condemned. The kingdom is in disarray because we have people that have accepted Jesus Christ not knowing that when you got him, you got it all. Everything you want is in Yeshua Messiah. Everything you need is in Jesus. And people many times try to add to Jesus, try to do something to help Jesus. Did you not know that in that name, there's everything you need? I dare you to call that name when you really need something and say it from your heart. I dare you to call him. There's something about the name of Jesus. Everything you need is in the name. Will the church say amen? So he was a man. Can the church say he was a man? And we note that he was a man because Jesus slept and he wept. He slept and he wept. He was a hunger. You may want to note these because some people tell you he was no man. Yes, he was. You know, uh, angels don't have to eat, holler back. Angels don't have to eat. The scripture doesn't even talk about angels fixing a dinner for themselves. Now, it will show them fixing a the dinner for somebody else. And it will show that Abraham entertained angels, and they told him, we don't really need your food. But he pressed on him, and I believe they ate a little snack anyway. Somebody say amen. But see, note here also that angels can go angels terrestrial as well as angels celestial. Angels can flip a body whenever they want to. They can be, hum they can be flesh, and yet they can be angelic. So angels are, are a prototype of the type of body that we will get. And it all because of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ. So he was a man. He wept, he slept, he hungered, he athirst. He was tempted in all fashion as a man. Somebody say, you mean Jesus was tempted? Of course he was tempted. But note here, Jesus' temptation did not come from within. All the temptation that Jesus received came from without. Because if his temptation came from within, that means that he had sin. But temptation that comes from without, that means that sin was trying to get in on him. So he received the same temptation, but it wasn't from within, it came from without. That means that he was a God man. And he said that I and you and ye and me, and if, if he's in you, the God man that's in him also can be in you. He can be in you that there's no power over you. 
He said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he is a God man, but yet he wants us to know him as a natural man. Stay with me, church. He went on and he began to do a mission of redemption in the, for the terrestrial man. Note that the celestial man was on a mission of redemption to redeem the terrestrial man. Celestial, that word there means angelic. That means divine. Terrestrial means man's skin, flesh, dirt. So he was on a divine mission in a terrestrial, celestial body to redeem the terrestrial body. Will the church say amen? He proved that in 1 Corinthians, as Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15 and 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. So Jesus here was letting us know that God had sent him on a divine redemption mission. Now what does that mean? That means young people need to know that. They're not here by accident. God is going to love you through your crazy stages. He understands that he has a much greater plan for you. He understands that if he can get you to the other side, that if he can get you to the other side of your mind where you can mature, get you to the other side of your mind where, where God can begin to deal with some things on the inside of you. How many of you know in here, those of you that, that are adults, how many of you know that you went through your crazy stage? Holler back. Now, y'all should be saying a little bit more than that. Don't try to act like you already had Jesus. You know you was drunker than a skunk, smoking on a joint, getting high, chasing skirts. You was doing everything, chasing men. You was out there bad. But God loved you through your crazy stage. That's the problem in the kingdom now. Everybody try to want to act like you already there. Negro, you know you haven't already been there. You just got there last year. Somebody holler back. We got to understand that God will love us no matter where we're at. You go to hell, he's going to love you there. You're locked up, he's going to love you there. Cracked up, he's going to love you there. Alcoholic, he's going to love you there. Smoking dope, he's going to love you. No matter what you're doing, he's going to love you right where you at. But he don't want you to stay where you at. Look to your neighbor and say, it's time to get up from your mess. It's time to get up from your mess. Hallelujah. So he was a man. He, he was tempted. He, he suffered. He did some things. Look to your neighbor and say, he did some things. But he didn't let the things do him. So note that, that he's, he's, he's Messiah. He loved you. Jesus also was on a mission. Uh-huh, he was on a mission. I'm going to give you these. The first one, he was a man. The second one, he was on a mission. How many of you have a mission? Do you have a mission statement for your life? Jesus had a mission statement for his life. He was on a mission. And his mission was not impossible. His mission was possible because God would never tell you to do something that he know you can't do it. Holla back. You see, if you're breathing, you have a mission. You just haven't discovered it yet. If you walk in this planet, see, you think you're just here so everybody can see how cute you are, how handsome you are. Look at me. No, 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 no. It's much deeper than that. Every last one of you in here from the time you came out your mother's womb, you have been on an assignment, a kingdom assignment, and that is to take this world over for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have been on kingdom assignment with a kingdom of genuine. Your mission is to do exactly what God has told you to do. He said, go forth into the world, baptizing them in the name of Jesus. He gave you the mission. Your mission is the same mission of Jesus. When you go out and tell people, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your mission is necessary. When you understand that your birth was God allowing you to be put into the fight. I was born into the fight. Help us, Holy Ghost. Mm, mm, mm. Born into the fight. And from the time I came out of my mother's womb, the devil was trying to kill me. 
Uh huh. How many understand what I'm talking about? From the time I came out of my mother's womb, the devil was trying to brutalize me, ostracize me, cause me to spend the rest of my life dealing with my pain and my strain and my decoy in my life. See, the moment you're born, the devil said, let me see if I can mess up the family so this child won't be what they need to be. The moment you're born, the devil said, let me see if I can give him a disease. Let me see if I can give him some type of a defect. Let me throw some on him. He want to mess you up because he know that you're on kingdom assignment for God. And the moment you came into this world, God needs you on the battlefield. You're thinking it's all about you, but it's not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. The moment you're born into this world, the devil know I got some more soldiers I got to mess with. He already knows that you have kingdom agenda in you, kingdom assignment in you. And what he want to do is pause in the well so as you drink of this stupid mess that's going on in the world, you'll forget about what your kingdom agenda and assignment is. You spend your whole life chasing rabbits and chasing decoys, trying to get to heaven by smoking a joint or getting high. But God told me to tell you, you can get there if you get drunk on Jesus. You got to make it up in your mind. You got to know that I was born to win, not born to lose. I was born to take over, not to born to be taken over. I was born to rise, not to stay low. I was born to go forth, not to hold back. I was born to be what the king need me to be. So what the devil does, he come at our kids. He, he try to get them chasing decoys. And hear me now, get this, you'll be chasing decoys until Jesus come. Because he don't want you to discover who you are. Some of us has made it out to the other side. We all got a story to tell. Some of us has made it to the other side. You know you was messed up. I mean, you was really bad. But God had brought you out of your mess. You was really locked down and locked in, messed up, but God lifted you up. You was too thought from being cuckoo, and you know it. How many ever been there where you know your mind just wasn't functioning like your mind need to function, and you found yourself saying things, doing things that you know it was God that brought you out? He said, if I can't get somebody to kill you, I want you to kill your silly self. Why? Because he's afraid of what's in you. Yeah, he was the God man. <laughs> he was the God man with a mission. And the last thing the devil wants you to know is what your mission is. Look to your name and say, what your mission is? See, your mission, he, he don't want you to understand what your mission is because most of the time when you find out what, what you're here for, you kind of go to that. So he wants you chasing rabbits squirrels, anything that can keep you from the kingdom agenda. So number two, the mission. Luke 4 and 18 tells us the mission of Jesus. Luke 4 and 18 tells us the spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what Jesus said. Talk to me, church. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because here's what I'm here to do. Uh, because he has anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance of the captive and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are what? Bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's Jesus Christ's mission statement. I would suggest to you if that's Jesus Christ's mission statement. If you are saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, why can't you co-opt that? Why can't that be your mission statement? You see, you're in a war, church. And the battle is fierce. The enemy knows that God needs you to do the work that Jesus said for you to do. He said, and the work that I do shall ye do also. He went on to say, and greater works than these shall ye do. He already told you that you're in the war. Everything about the kingdom of God is warfare. Even the love that we give to one another is about warfare because he said, Then men shall know that ye are my disciples by how ye love one another. That you not know that love is not just an emotional word. Love is a wartime word. 
Love is a disciplined word. Love is a chastening word. When you really love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. If you're trying to be deceitful to someone, you will lie all day long. Love is truth. God is love. And he sent his love to us wrapped up in skin, the God-man called Jesus. He loves us so much, but he says, not only do I love you, here is what I need for you to do. I need you to join the cause of occupying till I come. That's what Jesus said. The third thing that I want you to know is that the message of Jesus is important for you to know. You can find that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. The message of Jesus was pretty simple. Now, why is it important for me to regurgitate, to make sure that this is generational transference? Because our young people today think of Jesus as something spooky. They think of him as, in some cases, as a clown. They really don't value Jesus. And many times you can hear in the conversation and say, well, how can I know somebody that I never met? How can I formulate, or formulate a relationship with a being that don't talk to me? How can I begin to know about Jesus when all I hear about him is from what my mama said or my daddy said? How do I really get to know Jesus for myself? And I'm going to share this with you, young folks, and I can recall, I hope my daughter don't mind, but I can recall when she was a little girl, and she used to get very afraid, afraid at times, and she would wake up and, and come and be afraid. And I would tell her this, I said, listen, whatever show up again, just scream Jesus. Do you remember that? Just, just scream Jesus. She didn't understand what that meant. She was just a little girl. But she started screaming Jesus. You see, sometimes your children may not understand where you at, but it doesn't mean you don't pass the correct instructions on to them. You still have to give them the right instruction until they get there. And when they get there, they already have learned to work the power and authority. So when they get there, they can now operate in that power and authority. Don't hold your children back because you think they, they don't understand. You got to release the power on them in spite of them may not understand it. All you want them to do is to follow instruction. When they follow instruction, they can grow into power. Will the church say instruction leads to power? You better get that one. Instruction lead to power. He that can follow instruction will soon be in power. Instruction lead to power. They're just simply following the direct order. They're simply obeying. The scripture says obedience is better than sacrifice. So instruction lead to power. Someone tell you to go down the street, turn left, turn right, and at the corner look in the, uh, look in the red garbage bag. And you say you go down the street, turn left, you don't turn right, you keep doing what you're going, and you missed out on a million dollars that was waiting on you in the garbage bag. He that follow instructions, he that's disciplined, so don't shortchange your children. Tell them the right thing to do even if you don't believe that they want to hear the right thing to do. Will the church say Amen. So the message, what was Jesus' message? And stay with me now. What was Jesus' message? His message was to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's found in Matthew chapter uh, 4, verse 17. It also says in Matthew 5 and 44, Jesus said, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And you can read it on and you can see even more. So his message was a clear message. Jesus did not come with different types of doxology, demonology. He did not come with denomination or church cliques. He didn't come with any of that. He didn't come with Baptist, Presbyterian. He didn't come with Methodist. Jesus didn't come with any of those type of what I call division to keep the body from being strong. Jesus did not come from uh, divide and conquer. He didn't come from that. He just said one word, repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Now, the kingdom of heaven is at hand means that it's near, it's touchable, I can reach it, it's tangible. Repent. What does repent mean? It means to go in another direction. How? Through a changed mindset. You see, a changed mindset is what repentance is. You can stop doing something, but if your mind has not changed to want to do it, you haven't repented. I look back. Let me break it down for you a little bit more. See, if, if, if you can stop doing it, okay, you can say, I'm not going to do that no more. And you don't. But you still have the desire to want to do it. And when you have the desire to want to do it, how many know it's just a matter of time before you're going right back there? Repentance is spoken of out of your mouth, but God is the one that goes in your heart to help you take that thing away. And sooner or later over time, if your heart is repenting, then that means God get in it and help that thing to get away from you. But if you don't have a repentant heart, now let me break it down even further. If you're not really wanting to let it go, God ain't going to get involved in it. You got to want to let it go. You got to want to let that lie out your mouth go. You got to want to stop doing what you're doing. And when you get to that point, the Holy Ghost comes in. He helps you. Why? Because he's a paraclete. He's the one that aids and support you to keep you from doing what you don't want to do. And somebody said, well, is that true? Why don't people do it? Because some people have not made it up in their heart that they want to repent of something, go in another direction. I mean, Paul said it best when he said the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He went on to say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul got so confused until he said, with my mind I serve God, with my body I serve sin. Then he went over to Romans 8 and 37 and said, nay, in all these things, I'm more than a conqueror. And then he got so consumed with himself until he just, he just summed it up. I can't handle it. I can't stop it. I understand. I prayed three times for this mess to leave me. It just won't leave. And Jesus said, for my grace is sufficient. Paul went on and stamped it with his hallmark theme, which I have claimed as my own. And Paul stood up and said, but by the grace of God, <laughs> I am what I am. In other words, no matter how bad it gets, God still loved me. No matter what the devil tried to do to me, God still loved me. No matter how bad I act, God still loved me. He loved me in spite of myself. Will the church say amen? How many of you have came to that startling conclusion that you know <laughs> your best day is a mess day to God? If you haven't came there, you're not there yet. <laughs> My mama said, don't die. <laughs> Keep a living. If you haven't came there, you're not there yet because it's only when you know how good he is. Look to your name and say, he's good. I ain't lying. This, talk, act like you're licking on that ice cream song. Say, he's good. <laughs> Who don't want to serve a God that that knows you before you came out your mama womb. His name is Jesus. You see, I understand why the preacher's moving to a hoop because I feel, I feel a whole bunch of them right now. And, and I understand how it goes, but uh, I'm going to teach hoop for a moment. And I want you to understand this, understand this, that... Uh, I, I was getting ready to do a little thing called Don't Release the Hoop. I look back. <laughs> what I want you to understand is sometimes the word get good, it, 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 it just get good to you. <laughs> it, I, I ain't lying, it, it just get all in your toes, your toenails, and all in your throat. And, and, and if you're not careful, you, you can find yourself moving into a rhythmatic way of delivering the word. That's why I'm not mad at them old preachers. I'm not, I'm not mad at them. The Bible says that it is the foolishness of preaching that saves men's souls. Uh-huh. I'm not upset with them, but, but I do believe that when we come to know Jesus, that there's a, there's a whole other thing that begins to take on the inside of us. The word becomes like medicine. The scripture says that a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a, a broken spirit drives the bone. I understand the shout because I used to run around the church. 
I understand the hoop because I used to hoop with the best of them. I understand all of that. And I, but what I understand most is that when God is in you, there's something on the inside of you that may make you run, but with some folks now, you may just want to just moan and holler and, and just scream out by yourself. There's something about God. There's something in him that you may want to clamp it down, but you may just have to take off sometimes. I get it. It's, 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 it's the spectrum. Look to your neighbor and say, it's the spectrum. It's the spectrum on the shout, the kingdom spectrum. At times, you may just want to do stuff that everybody thinks is crazy. It's the kingdom spectrum. You may not be at the hollering stage. Somebody else is. You may not be at the hooping stage, but somebody else is. You may not want to run around the church, but somebody else do. It's the kingdom spectrum. The kingdom spectrum. Where you at on the kingdom? We can't put him in a box. We can't put him in a box. The leper was running and they, they said, Jesus, master, have mercy upon us. He said, ain't got time to play with y'all. Just go show yourself to the king. Go show yourself to the praise. Another man got healed. He jumped and shot and ran around. It's the spectrum. Can everybody say the kingdom spectrum? See, the more you mature in God, you understand the spectrum. One old lady may moan, another old lady may get up and jump and shout. And bump the music. You ain't going to, ain't no music now, is it? Holla back. I'm just trying to tell you how the power flows. Ain't no music now, ain't it? But you up, right? You up! Ain't no music right now. Why? Because you can feel what God has done for you. You know God. And nobody got to be playing no music, don't, 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 don't. Ain't got to do all that. It's the power of God that resides in you. When the word of God is spoken, the power will flow. You got to understand that it's all about Jesus. Oh, you may be seated. If you want to. So the message of Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now the miracle. You're not going to want to miss next month. Because we're going to chop next month up. Everything going to be dealing with miracles. And Wednesday night Bible study. <laughs> you see when you know him. You better be careful when you drive in your car. I'm going to tell you what God loves, and that's the truth. Be on the full advisement that make sure that when you start your vehicle that you have the Holy Spirit in check because if you're driving down the road, you can have an accident. Now, the Holy Spirit ain't going to lead you to no crash, but sometimes you can be out your mind and drive yourself into somebody else because you're praising while driving. <laughs> I think it's the same thing as driving under the influence. I think it's better that if you just pull alongside the road, put your blinkers on, Get out and get your praise on. Get back in, start the car up, and go on by your business. Now, I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I do. Sometimes you got to look stupid when you want God to move. You got to look crazy when you want God to move. When you're wrestling with a gorilla in your life, you got to do some crazy stuff to get that gorilla out of your life. You may have to shout. You may have to holler. You may have to scream in the midst of your mess. Ain't no such thing as the pretty praise. Forget all that. 
I don't want to shout because I got this cute suit on and my dress on. That means you're on a different spectrum. It, it, remember, it's the spectrum. Where you at in the kingdom spectrum? <laughs> oh, you may be seated in the house of God. I don't know about you, but I received miracles from Jesus, and I'm in the process of looking for more miracles. Uh, you heard him say, dead man walking. You're looking, seeing a miracle walking. I keep up with the miracles that God has done for me because I know if it wasn't for Jesus, and uh, I, I would have been dead. I, I'm talking about graveyard dead, worms out my body and rotted and everything. I would have been dead a long time ago. So it's where you at on the kingdom spectrum. I know you like that. Where you at on the kingdom spectrum? Where are you? But don't condemn someone that ain't where you at. Look to your neighbor and say, where you at? Getting ready to do a song on that one. Look at him again and say, where you at? Say, where you at? I had to come to understand that everybody's not where everybody's at. Some people believe in miracles. Some people believe in witchcraft. Some believe in hocus pocus, but we serve a king was dealing with miracles. Matthew 11, go there if you please. Chapter, Matthew chapter 11, read verse 5 and 6. It's going to bless you. And everything that Jesus has done, you can do. I want you so fired up until you start getting an attitude with the devil. I want you to get up in his face and say, shut up, I'm talking. You have no authority here. I want you so cocky with that Holy Ghost swag until even the people that you're around, that you work with, say something is different about her. She has changed. I want you to be able to walk with a confidence that everybody will know that this is a kingdom man and that's a kingdom woman. There is nothing more powerful than a kingdom man and a kingdom woman. The purpose of the kingdom man and the kingdom woman is to fuse together and become one for God. When that takes place, the devil becomes afraid of you as a couple. Matthew 11 and 5, can you read it? It says this, we'll read verse 5 through 6, it says, here's what Jesus, what the miracles that he did. It says the blind receive what? Their sight. And the lame what? Walk. The leper what? Are cleansed. And the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You have that power. So I want the young people to know and, and the older that you serve a king that has given you that power. You're not just riding in the back of the car. Hear me now. Get this, young folks. You're not in the back of the car asking mama, are we there yet? My son, every time we would go on a trip, he, he would say, are we there yet? And then when he got there, his next question was, what are we going to do now? I used to get tired of hearing him say, are we there yet? And what are we going to do now? Okay, what are we going to do now? You're driving for five hours, you get there, it's like that ain't enough for him. He want to know what we're going to do now. But well, we just rode five hours. I want the children to understand that you're not in the back of the seat any longer. You was born for divine kingdom assignment. And your question is not, are we there yet? Your question is not, what we're going to do now? Your question is, mom, dad, what is my kingdom assignment? What does God want me to do for his kingdom? 
Your parents should look at you and know what God has put in you already. And whatever he has put in you, that should be your kingdom assignment. If it's in the marketplace, your kingdom assignment. If it's on the basketball court, your kingdom assignment. If it's in the, in, in the boardroom, your kingdom assignment. Wherever God has gifted you at will be your kingdom assignment. You're not here by accident. You're here to do signs, miracles, and wonders. Number five, the betrayal. You cannot betray someone if you're not in relationship with them. Number two is the mission. Number three is the message of Jesus. Number four is the miracle. Number five is the betrayal. Note here that you cannot be betrayed by someone that you're not in relationship with. Remember, I told you earlier, is that because you get introduced to someone does not mean you're in relationship with them. And note this, because your parents introduce you to someone that they know doesn't mean that you automatically get the benefits of the relationship that your parents have with them. You got to get to know them for yourself. So you can't act like you've been knowing someone for 30 years and your parents was knowing them before you was born. Now you want to jump in and act like you don't have to build that. You want to act like that you don't have to cultivate a relationship with someone because your parents know them. Well, the same is true with Jesus. Because your parents know Jesus doesn't mean that you automatically come in and you get co-op in because your mama and them know Jesus. You got to work on that relationship with Jesus for yourself. Your mama may know him as a healer, but you can know him as a negotiator in the boardroom. Your father may know him as a lawyer. But you can know him as a millionaire. Look to your neighbor and say, you got to work your own relationship with Christ. But know this, you cannot be betrayed by someone that you don't really talk to. Betrayal comes from someone that you are in relationship with. He was betrayed by Judas. And worse than that, he was betrayed with a kiss. If someone's so close to you that they can, that they, the proximity, they're so close to you and, and you love them, but yet while you're loving them, they're betraying you. See, he got betrayed because a kiss is very close by someone that really didn't care about Jesus. You can find that in Mark 14, 45, 44 through 45. That's Luke chapter 22, 48 through 54. You see, he was a man, but he was a God man. Number seven, the mocking of Jesus and the Roman soldiers beating Jesus. Have you ever been made fun of? And today, I don't know how kids can get away with cyberbullying. I don't get that. I was afraid to walk down the street because the bully was waiting on me down the street. I was afraid to make sure that when I came out of class that I walked by the principal's office because I was scared to go out and to, to catch the bus because the bully was waiting on me. Just in case you didn't know it, I was bullied growing up. Yes, I was. But I finally confronted the bully. And the whole thing changed. <laughs> now the bull is scared. When you find out that you can do to the bully what the bully was doing to you, it's sweet. <laughs> now the bully running. But not knowing that the bully is only bullying because he's been bullied. So they mocked me, they made fun of me, they talked about me. Black, get back, poor, raggedy. It dogged me out. But that's nothing compared to Jesus. How many of you have ever been talked about? 
See, so you can tap into that. You can tap into the fact where they talked about me, so they marked Jesus, so you and Jesus got some stuff in common. The old women used to say, well, they talked about Jesus. My mama said it the way, you can talk about me as much as you please, but the more you talk, I'm going to bend my knees. See, so let them talk about you as long as you stay on your knees. The Bible said that Jesus said not a mumbling word. Okay, so they mocked him. Number, number eight, they uh, took him to the preliminary hearing. They took him to Herod. Number nine, they gave him an arraignment. They took him to trial. They gave the verdict. The verdict was guilty as charged. Note here that the only reason why Jesus was found guilty is because of this. Of one word, it's called sedition. He was guilty of sedition. Guilty of sedition, the word sedition itself means to resist. It means to be in insurrection. It means to go against the law and authority. Basically, sedition, they was charging Jesus with starting a riot. Charging Jesus with starting a riot against the Roman government. And then from their preliminary hearing, at not the preliminary hearing, after they arraigned him and gave the verdict, then they sentenced him. They sentenced Jesus to death. Now, it wasn't a weak death. It was a death by crucifixion being nailed on the cross. Now, the cross that you have that we see today, that was not the exact type of cross that Jesus was put on. And we have people wearing the cross. That cross was a Roman's cross. But the cross that Jesus was on was a wooden stake. The Greek word there for wooden stake is he was on a, on a staros, meaning that it was a wooden stake. It would be like going outside looking at telephone poles. He was on a made staros with his hands up, his feet like that, and they was, did what they did to him. It wasn't his hands out. His hands was up. Now, many will, will say that, well, his hands was out and, and, uh, and all of that, and you, get, you have to go back and go to the Aramaic, the Hebrew, the Greek, to understand that it was a wooden stake, and a wooden stake was a, was a, uh, a beam that went straight up and down. So the point is, is that he was crucified for our sins. And he was hanging on the cross. The Greek there, a staros, a wooden stake. The death of Jesus and his burial of the tomb, the resurrection, they did not believe that Jesus would raise from the dead. They said no one has been risen from the dead not knowing that the Bible has recorded 10 that was raised from the dead. And let me give you these real quick. You have Elijah raised from the dead. Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath's son from the dead. That's 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. You have Elisha raised the Shulamite son from the dead. That's 2 Kings 4. 20 through 37. Number three, you have a man tossed into Elijah's tomb. He was tossed into the tomb of Elijah. Elijah was dead and the man was dead. But when he tossed him into the tomb of Elijah, the man got up and walked out. You can find that in 2 Kings 13 and 21. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the widow of Nan's son raised from the dead by Jesus. Jesus stopped a funeral procession in order to raise this boy up from the dead. That's Luke 7, 13 through 14. 
Number five, the synagogue ruler, Jarius, 12-year-old daughter raised from the dead by Jesus. That's Luke 8, 49, and also through 55, Mark 5 and 42. The one we hear about the most is Lazarus, raised from the dead by Jesus. That's John 11, 1 through 44. These are in what we classify as the New Testament. Now let's take a look at what we can do as human beings. The first three was with God. The next one was Jesus. But now we're going to look at the 12 apostles. These are people like us who raised other people from the dead. Number seven, Peter raised Tabitha from the dead. That's Acts 9, 36 through 41. Jesus was raised from the dead by God. This is, this is the apostle. He was raised from the dead by God. That's Mark 16, verse 9. Paul raised up Eclipsus from the dead. That's Acts 20, 7 through 12. And Paul was the last person raised from the dead after being stoned to death by an unruly mob at Lystra. And that's Acts 14, 9 through 20. So there have been many been raised from the dead before Jesus was raised from the dead, was proved the fact that the evidence demands a verdict. The verdict is that Jesus was found guilty by man, but by God, he was an innocent lamb, and he is risen. In my conclusion, closing argument, everything about Jesus Christ was foretold through over a hundred biblical prophecies of his coming, his birth, a virgin birth, his teaching the kingdom of God, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. And the final evidence that we get and know that Yeshua lives is that the tomb was empty. And I want you to know this morning that you serve a risen Savior. You serve a Savior that came and died for your sins. You serve a Savior that knows where you are on the kingdom spectrum. You serve a Savior that know that when he died on the cross, he died not just for your present sin, but he died for your future sin. He died for every wicked and every foul and every bad and every crazy thing that you would ever do in life. Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach came and died for your sin and he rose again that you may have right to everlasting life. If you know him for yourself, somebody scream, Jesus! If you know him for yourself, somebody scream, he's my savior. Somebody scream, I love him. Shout, Yeshua Messiah. Yeshua Messiah. Yeshua Hamashiach. He lives. He moves. He reigns. He has authority in this world and in my life. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. Yeshua Messiah. Yeshua Hamashiach. Jesus is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen from the tomb and in the tomb of my heart. He's risen. If you believe that, give God a hand praise in the house of God. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Is there one here this morning that after hearing the word of God, maybe you're not saved. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Maybe.